So a question I get asked a lot is what is the best computer for hacking? So I thought I'd do a video showing my thoughts on the different kinds of hardware and what I would recommend. Now, first up is the operating system. You might actually be surprised by this, but it doesn't matter. It is whatever operating system you are most comfortable with. There are gonna be tools that only run on Linux, they only run on Windows, but that's what virtual machines are for. So it is important that you can support virtual machines. I'll get to what those requirements are later, but basically any tool you can't run on your base operating system can be run in a virtual machine. And most tools you're gonna to want to run in a virtual machine anyway. So really just use whatever operating system you are most familiar with. Now next up is desktop versus laptop. Again, this is personal preference. If you travel a lot, you're gonna want a laptop. If you're at home a lot, you're gonna want a desktop. And if you do a bit of both, then I recommend if you can afford it, having a good desktop and a good laptop. And desktops have a much higher performance ceiling. They can just genuinely be better than laptops can be. And also desktops have a cheaper cost to performance ratio. So if you want the most possible performance and at the cheapest price, then always go for a desktop. Now, branding is another thing that is, again, personal preference. Uh, you will have luxury brands that basically just charge you more for the same components. As you notice here, I have a Dell XPS and that's one of my favorites. It does, however, charge you a lot more for the same performance. I just like that it has a very sleek uh, chrome finish. It does have its downside. The screen is just a single big glass panel and the webcam is actually on the bottom of the screen. So if you put a webcam cover on it, it is going to crack the screen. You can bypass this with electrical tape, but that's just something to be aware of. But it is very, very sleek and it looks pretty damn nice. For desktop computers, I recommend building your own if you can. You're gonna save a lot of money there and all of the brands really don't matter. They're just gonna upcharge you for the same hardware. All of my computers are custom built. I like the NXT cases and then the components are pretty much personal choice. Now, one question that everyone seems to ask is water cooling or not? Now, as far as I'm aware, there are no processors that actually require water cooling or water cooling gives a noticeable performance bump. The uh, technology in air cooling now is so good that it can keep up with most water cooling. The only real benefit to water cooling is it's quieter. You can spread the fans out over more distance rather than having them all compacted on the CPU cooler. That said, there are some very big risks with water cooling. It can leak and destroy all of your components. I would absolutely never, ever go for a custom water cooling loop. They are absolutely prone to leakage. They come with all kinds of problems. You get residue in the reservoir. It is not worth it. They are very much an aesthetic thing. They look very cool. I did think about building a custom water cooling loop for the uh, computer behind me because that is simply just for show, but it is not something you want to deal with in an actual functioning work machine. If you do go for water cooling, closed loops like the Kraken X72 are great. The model doesn't really matter. I just like the bigger radiators because you can get three big fans on those. Also the larger the radiator, obviously the larger the cooling surface. Now the CPU is the most important part. There are a couple of ways you can go with this. You have the clock frequency and the core count. And this really depends on your workload. If you're doing stuff like virtual machines, rendering, anything that's multi-processing, especially hash cracking, the more cores is gonna be better. And if you're doing anything like super high performance, like gaming, then the high uh, clock frequency is gonna be better. And you can get a good mix of both. Ideally, you want as many cores as you can get and as high core frequency as you can get. But if you don't have the money to get a top of the line CPU, then you need to look at what you think your workload is gonna be. Is it gonna be more multi-processing or more high performance? And then make a decision on whether you want to look at the core frequency or the core count. Now, AMD versus Intel, guess what? Again, it's personal preference. It really doesn't matter. Just go with whatever you like. The only thing that does matter is you need virtualization. Now this is called AMD V for AMD and VTX for Intel. On the Intel CPU page, it will usually tell you if the CPU is virtualization capable. It'll have a little VTX flag somewhere. I've checked through a lot of the AMD CPU sites and it doesn't seem to say 
So you're probably gonna have to Google and like go through Reddit or something to figure it out, but you absolutely must have virtualization because without that, you're not gonna be running any virtual machines and it's gonna hugely impact your ability to run other operating systems, which you will often need to run certain tools. Now, a little trick here is pcpartpicker.com. It will basically allow you to pick your PC parts and it will tell you if they are compatible with each other. Now, this might seem like an incredibly rudimentary thing, but you'd be surprised how easy it is to make beginner mistake. The one that always gets me is some CPUs do fit into the motherboard socket, but they require a motherboard BIOS update to run. So if you just upgraded to a new socket and the CPU that you need a BIOS update to run is the only CPU you have that fits that socket, well, great, now your entire computer doesn't work and you're gonna to have to go out and find a CPU that does work in order to run the BIOS update and then put in the CPU you had planned in the first place. I have done this on three different occasions. It's a huge waste of time and money, but it's very easy to avoid and PC Part Picker will always tell you if you need a BIOS update for that CPU to work in the socket or if it doesn't work with that socket at all. It'll also, I think, tell you whether your motherboard will fit in the case whether the RAM goes in the motherboard, basically make sure all of your PC components are compatible with each other. Now for RAM, obviously the higher capacity, the better. You're probably going to want an absolute minimum of 16 gigabytes for VMs. I would typically say a healthy minimum is 32 and ideally you want to go for 64 gigabytes. Now obviously the higher the clock frequency, the better. It doesn't really make a huge difference unless you're doing something like gaming. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Just get some decent DDR4 or DDR5 RAM. I also recommend learning how to set XMP profiles. The clock rate the RAM is advertised as is actually its overclock rate and it runs at a much lower frequency. Now there is a risk it makes your system unstable. So you wanna do a little bit of testing to make sure it runs okay, but you will get a huge performance boost by setting the XMP profile and running at the overclocked frequency, which is what is advertised versus whatever the base frequency is. Now, what monitor should you get? It's personal preference. So there are typically two ways to go. There is the multiple small monitors or the one big curved monitor. A lot of people I see are now using these big curved monitors. I've actually not tried them yet. Now, as you might be able to see from the computer behind me, I have two 27 inch monitors. Those are both 1440p. Now, typically I recommend the higher resolution is better with the exception of laptops. With small laptop screens, if you go 4K or above, there is a risk that some applications that don't set the DPI properly will basically make the text so small that you have to put your face inside your laptop to read it. For laptops, 1080p is fine. 1440p is good. 4K things do get a little bit sketchy. Now GPU, you actually might not need one at all, but I would always recommend having a GPU and not needing it than not having one and needing it. You can skate by on the built-in graphics in your CPU, but if you find yourself doing something that's very multi-processor heavy, like password cracking or rendering, that's always better offloaded to the GPU. I think I have an RTX 3080. It's absolutely great for rendering, great for password cracking. I do recommend getting a good GPU just in case. You may not need it, but it's always a good thing to have. Now in terms of motherboard, really anything modern that fits your CPU should be suffice. Um, I like to check that they have the USB 3 ports because those can come in very handy, especially the USB-C ones. And on top of that, I like a couple of NVMe ports. NVMe SSDs are so much faster than SATA ones. And finally, the power supply. I think PC Part Picker will tell you what is the minimum that you can run your components on. I recommend adding a couple of hundred watts to whatever the minimum is. Now you don't need these thousands and thousands of watt PSUs unless you're running SLI and multiple CPUs. Something usually uh, 800 to 1000 is suffice. I think all of mine are about 850. Now always look for the Gold Plus. That conserves power a bit better and it'll lower your energy bill while also not hitting performance. 